What is up, Harrison Bridge? What's going on? Y'all here this morning? I don't know if I am, because I just served at Reckless, and I am tired, but I'm running on caffeine. It's actually ungodly how much caffeine's been put in my body this weekend. I need to repent for it, but we'll get there. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. I'm actually Dallas Wilson, your campus pastor. Danny did something so funny this week. Let me tell you about it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm Mason Leonard. As he said, I'm a junior at Anderson University, and I'm so thankful for Dallas and just how he leads y'all so well and shepherds y'all so well. I know you're so thankful for his family, and I'm thankful to be here. It's an honor. It really is. Uh, before the Anderson campus got up and running, I was able to come here my freshman and sophomore year, and it, it's just always such a sweet spirit in worship, and with a pastor named Dallas, you've got to hear the word every week. It's, it's so good, and I'm thankful for it. Um, a little bit about Reckless this weekend. Um, I know a lot of you were probably a part of that, whether you were a student or a parent helping out, or God bless you, a host home. I'm so sorry for you, but um, I had a great time, and I'm so thankful to see the baptisms up here, people coming from death to life, and a story about that uh, that happened this weekend, last night actually, uh, it was so cool uh, just to see the Lord move. You know, a lot of times we get this idea that like, the younger generation is just, like, gone. Like, there's no way to reach them anymore. Sin is just running too rampant, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's the message that we get a lot of times. But I saw this weekend that the Lord is still moving in the hearts of young people. Last night, um, at our host home, after the service, I was just shooting basketball with just one guy in the group. And we had made a friendship over the break, um, over the weekend, and I had senior guys. This guy had never been to First Baptist before. He'd never been a part of anything with the church. He had just came with someone. And he started telling me some really heavy stuff. He started telling me, you know, both of my parents are in jail. Uh, you know, I really don't have anything to hold on to. And like, man, you don't know how much it's meant to me that you've just been my friend this weekend. And so we started talking, and um, we went to the hot tub, because where else would you go if there's a hot tub? So we were sitting in the hot tub, and uh, it was me and this guy, and... Uh, one of my really good friends, and we just started talking to him about Jesus and how whenever we were his age, we wish we would have just decided then, like, this life is better for Jesus. Well, my friend started describing to him, he said, you know what you need to do? If you really want to follow Jesus, if this is the decision you want to make today, you need to have a flag in the ground moment is what he called it. You need to have a time to look back to and say, that's where I started doing it. And as my friend explained this to him, the guy that we were talking to said, can this hot tub be my flag in the ground moment? And we said, yes, 100%. So that was just so good to see the Lord do that in his life and do that in so many lives this weekend. And I'm so thankful to hear so much about it. Jesus is still moving. <clears throat> he's still saving souls. And he's still meeting us right where we are. That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 9, 10 through 17. Jesus always has time to meet us right where we are. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. Jesus always has time to meet us right where we are. This is the only miracle in all four Gospels that we can find. It's the only miracle that is recorded in each and every Gospel. You've probably heard the story before, and if you haven't, you just heard me read it, and you probably had a mental picture in your mind of maybe like 
somebody, let's say Steph Curry, like really popular guy, he's just walking along, and all these people start running up to him and saying, like, oh my gosh, it's you, it's really you, and just all these people start coming up to him, and then you probably have this mental image of Jesus saying, oh, we should feed these people, and everybody says, oh, we just have two fish and five loaves, so what are we going to do? Jesus starts pulling bread out of his cargo shorts, because cargo shorts can hold anything, and like, you just have a lot of pockets, but if that's our perception of this story, then we've missed the point. If it's just the perception of just a picnic where Jesus is just doing this cool thing, we've missed the point of what he's doing here. You see, the disciples had just returned from healing and casting out demons after Jesus had gave them authority to do so. As they came back, the crowd had followed them, and Jesus was going to take them out to rest. So they're doing all of these things in the name of Jesus, all these great things, all these life-changing things. So all this crowd is wanting to get some more of it. They're wanting to keep seeing God move. They're wanting to see, keep seeing, okay, what's, what is it about this Jesus guy? So we see at the beginning of this passage in verse 2, what they're returning from is Jesus sending them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. You see, and Jesus told these disciples when they went out, to take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And the apostles went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they were completely dependent on the power Jesus gave them. He told them, don't take your money, don't take your bag, don't take any of your belongings, just go do my work. And that's what they did. They were doing the good thing. They were doing what they were told in the name of Jesus. You see, but in Mark's account of this story, in verse 34, says, when he went ashore, he being Jesus, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You see, Jesus had a plan to get away. His disciples and the apostles were planning to go away. They were on the way to do something totally different from what they, where they've ended up now. But you know what threw them off track? You know what changed the plan? Is Jesus saw sheep without a shepherd. So you say, what does this even mean? Well, how does that apply to me? Well, at the time, Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch's a weird word, I can barely say it. I thought I was going to mess it up just now. I didn't, praise God. Um, Herod is a ruler of this day. He's not a king necessarily, but he's the ruler of these people in this time. And Herod's actually the person who killed John the Baptist. John the Baptist is who baptized Jesus. John the Baptist was super close to Jesus. Uh, they walked together, they lived together. And Herod actually respected and had favor for John the Baptist. But you see, Herod was so caught up in his own image. Herod was like trying to prove his power so often. He was trying to build his status up, build his rule up. So in those efforts, he was having a party and had all of his rich friends around him. So to prove a point, he has John the Baptist killed. So this kind of gives you an idea of the manipulative, narcissistic, and paranoid ruler of the day. Like, this is who is leading those people. This is who is leading the crowds that are running to Jesus right now. It's a bad dude. Like, it's not a good guy. But in, meanwhile, as all of that's happening, out in the field, there's the king of kings who sees sheep without a shepherd. Out where he can touch the people. Out where he can talk face to face with the people. Out where he can actually make a difference in someone's day because he cares. Is the king of kings. Not just some ruler of the day. You see, out in this field, there's a leader to care for them. And there's a heart to provide for them. You see, in this passage, as we were just talking about, the apostles are telling Jesus all that they've done. They've really figured out ministry here because... They've done all the work that needs to be done. They've said all that needs to be said. And then they're trying to get the people out because you don't want to prolong it. So let's just get out of here. That's just how it works sometimes, right? And so they're saying, I can just imagine, man, Jesus, all the power and authority you gave us to go out there and heal people, see people believe the gospel. Man, that was a great time. But we are tired. Let's get it. Let's get out of here. Let's go rest. You see, they feel like they've done all they could do. They feel like anything that needs to be done has been done. As far as they need to go, they have went. And that's fair. We need rest as people. But Jesus is different. Jesus is still on mission. Jesus still cares whenever 
the human flesh is tired. Jesus still cares, and he's still on mission. So let's remind ourselves of the scripture here. Number one, Jesus is the one who cares. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. Notice what Jesus is doing here. He's doing the exact same thing that they had just got done doing. He's telling about the kingdom of God, and he's healing those people who need it. You see, what I see here, what's going on here, is Jesus is consistent. Whenever Jesus sees a need, he moves with compassion to that need. When Jesus sees a need in your life, he is acting as our intercessor to the Father. He is fighting on our behalf when we pray that prayer. Jesus is for us. And when he sees a need, he moves with compassion. Because Jesus is always interruptible. In this time where he had a plan, he was headed one place, and he had a plan to go somewhere, but he was interrupted. It's because he's interruptible. He's not inconvenienced to hear your troubles. He's not tired of hearing your prayers. You see, I want you to get this. Jesus is the most accessible person to ever walk the earth. Jesus is the most approachable person ever. In all of his glory, all of his holiness, no one in history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. I want you to know today that there are no hoops to jump through. There are no boxes to check because Jesus just so deeply desires to bear your burdens. You see, in our own strength, we can start to feel good about ourselves just like the disciples. And when we feel like we've done enough to maybe be able to take a break for a while, just like the apostles did. But Jesus does not work that way. He stays on mission because he so deeply cares. Hey, I want you to know, if it matters to you today, it matters to him. It doesn't matter if it's too small and you just feel like it's one of those things that's not even worth praying for. It could be something that's so big that you feel like it's just too big to take to him and it's not going to get fixed anyway. It's just one of those things that you're just going to have to live with. No. If it matters to you, it matters to him. So let's lay it at his feet. I have an example here. And for example, last fall break, one of my friends are here right now, Andrew Riggs, shout out. But my friends are so smart. They really are. They're so educated and scholarly. So one day, me and Riggs are sitting on the couch, and one of us, I don't remember who, says, what if we just drive to Houston, Texas? And I'm like, oh, yeah, great idea. Not taking him serious. So we call one of our other friends who's actually crazy. He's a psycho. And we call him, and we're like, hey, we're going to go to Houston, Texas. You coming with us? And, like, he's not even phased. He's like, yes. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm just kidding. He was like, no, 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 you're too far in now. I'm going to flip a coin, and if it lands on tails, we're driving to Texas. If it lands on heads, we just won't go. It's not a big deal. So the next day, we're on the way to Texas, and uh, we get there, and I could literally tell you this story, all that happened until next Sunday, but I'll skip to the end and tell you about whenever we were making the drive home, and we stopped to get gas in Slidell, Louisiana. Did anybody know where that is? I am so sorry. Um, I, I hope you don't have family there. I hope you're not from there. But Satan has a vacation home there, for sure. Um, so we, we pull up to slide of Louisiana at a gas station. We stop, and we're getting gas, just like any other time. And we get back in the car, and the car does not even try to start. Like, the car is dead as a doorknob. And we're like, oh my goodness. We are 500 miles from absolutely anybody that we know or love or care about and we don't know what to do. So be, being three 20-year-olds, we don't want to reach out to people who actually care. We want to reach out to strangers. Uh, we want to go and make sure like, we can just get this fixed. It's not even a big deal at this moment. Uh, it's probably just this or that. So we'll, we'll reach out to some strangers. We don't want people to worry that care about us, stuff like that. 
So I walk up to the gas station. As I'm walking to the gas station, the guy that's working locks the door in front of my face and goes like this. So I'm like, okay, check that one off the list. That's not what's going to work. I'm walking back to the car. Get to the car. We're thinking, okay, what's going to happen now? A cop pulls up. So we're like, yes, he'll help. Gets out of his car. We are just standing here. We start telling him what's going on. We're three 20-year-olds, stranded, 500 miles from anybody. We need some help. He's like, hmm, let me look at this. Let me look at this. He comes over, looks in the engine, maybe 30 seconds, pushing it. He looks in the engine, he's like, hope y'all get that figured out. Gets in his car and leaves us. <laughs> so I'm like, and I don't even have time to process, like, are you serious? I'm just like, is this really happening right now? So third resort, last and final thing, only other thing I know to do, I call AAA because they help in emergencies, right? No, they don't. Um, I call AAA. And it does, a person doesn't even answer the phone. It's like a recording, and it says, I'm sorry, we're not functioning right now. There's a hurricane headed your way. <laughs> so literally, our lives are falling apart. Like, they say a hurricane is happening right now. And we are like, okay, we'll never see anyone we love again. Let's go ahead and say our prayers. We've had a good life. Love y'all boys, but it's over. You see, but at some point in the night, things start to shift. Because what we do at some point in the night is we finally start reaching out to the people who do care. You see, I call a friend and hear the comfort that I need to hear to kind of settle my nerves. I call my mom, and there's no telling what those prayers did for us that night. Sam calls his dad, and it just so happens that there's a family friend like 35 minutes away. And it was 3 a.m., but he just so happened to fall asleep with his phone on his chest. And then... Sam's dad drives 10 hours through the night, picks us up, drives 10 hours back, 20 straight hours he drives. And you see, my point here is, when we give our burdens to the one who cares, that's the only way we can start to find victory. When we give our burdens to the only one who cares, that's the only time we can find victory. So often we'll start turning to a friend before we turn to Jesus. So often we'll start turning to a pleasure before we turn to Jesus. Maybe it's a sport for you today. Maybe it's a job for you today. Whatever your outlet is to get you away from troubles. Maybe it's alcohol that you just try to drown out your problems for a night and just forget about it, but then they're still there the next morning. Whatever it is that you're clinging to, if it's not Jesus, then it does not have the ability to care like he does. If you're not resting in Jesus, it does not have the ability to care as he does. You see, because when Jesus sees your need, he moves with compassion. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So this is Jesus talking here. And what he's saying is the very fact that you have a burden, the very fact that you even have a problem in your life is what qualifies you to come to him. You don't have to unburden yourself. You don't have to uh, give up that sin initially. You just have to come to him and all that will work itself out. You do not have to unburden yourself or get yourself together to come to Jesus Because your burden is what qualifies you to come to him. He says, come to me, all who who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It does not say, come to me, all who are put together and things are going great, I'll give you rest. That's not what it's saying. All who labor and are heavy laden. You're restless here today. You've got things going on here today. And you're trying to hang on to whatever you can to find satisfaction. You're hanging on to whatever you can to find victory and freedom. And the only thing that can do it is Jesus. Because he cares, he provides. Number two, let's look at the back half of the text here, starting in verse 13. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we were to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 
12 baskets of broken pieces. You see this? The same disciples who are tired and want to go home, their plan is just to send the people away. Those same people, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Like, that sounds kind of disrespectful. Like, I don't want to feed them, Jesus. Like, I don't even want to do that. What are you talking about? This reminds me of uh, a problem I have in my life, and it's that I can't fill my truck up with gas. Like, I have ran out of gas literally 10 times. I'm not exaggerating. And, like, that's embarrassing to tell you right now. But I will say that my gas gauge doesn't work. So whenever I'm at a fourth of a tank, it's actually on E, which I know I just fill up at a fourth of a tank. My mom tells me all the time. Thanks, guys. But um, so (laughs) my family thought it was so funny this Christmas. My aunt's here, actually. She got me a shirt that says, I know my car with an E on it. That's hilarious, right? (laughs) The next day, I get a five-gallon gas can for my other aunt on the other side of the family. And, yeah, it's hilarious, right? So the gas can right now that I'm supposed to have filled up on the back of my truck for a time where I would run out of gas is at my home in Shelby, not even Anderson, not on the back of my truck, not filled up, useless to me. You see, all I have to do is just keep my tank full, and I just can't. I just won't. I have every opportunity, every call by my mom, every time I even get near my truck to call me and say, fill up your tank, and I just won't do it. I just don't come through. And I say all of that to say, if it were up to me to provide something, then I'm going to mess it up. And yet Jesus is telling these men who are just as as human as I am, you give them something to eat when it seems like there's nothing to give, when it seems like they can't come through at the moment. There's literally nothing they can do. And they're actually thinking, okay, practically, do we need to go out and buy food? I don't even know how to buy for 5,000 people. Like, I'm broke. Like, they do not see a way out here. And you know why Jesus says you give them something to eat? He's letting them feel how inadequate they are. He's letting them see how small they really are. You see, because they were so excited coming back to him after the power that he had given them. In the name of Jesus, in in his name, they were casting out demons. In his name, they were healing people's infirmities. In his name, they were telling people about the kingdom. But now they're right back to wondering what the solution to this problem is. It's like they've already forgot what Jesus had just done. They're wondering, okay, how are 5,000 people going to get fed with five loaves and two fish? And Jesus is reminding them that he's still the solution. The same Jesus who gave them the power is the same Jesus who's about to come through once again. You see, I think we do this so often. We'll get a really big thing. It seems so big when we're in the moment that this is just a bad issue. And we forget about all the times Jesus has been faithful in the past. We forget about all the times God has came through in the past when we didn't know how it was going to work, when we didn't know how it was going to come together, and it somehow did. We forget that he's the solution. You might be here and you're thinking, well, I'm nothing. I'm small. I'm a sinner. I've messed up too much. I'm insufficient. I have no ability. I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. I don't know. Like, there's literally no way it could get any better. And you know what Jesus is saying? If you're here thinking that, he's saying, perfect. That's right where I want you because now I can be glorified in your weakness. He's saying, now I can get to work because finally, you see, you can't do it on your own. This reminds me of a scene in Chronicles of Narnia. Does anybody like Chronicles of Narnia? Anybody watch that? Okay, okay, okay. I like it. So Lucy comes up to Aslan, the lion, and says, Aslan, you're bigger. Lucy says, that's because you are older. Lucy says, not because you're older. And Aslan says, I'm not. But every year that you grow, you will find me bigger. You see, when we get closer to Jesus, when we see him for who he really is, we realize how small we are and how big he is. You see, so many times in my life, I've, I've prayed the prayer, God, what's your will for this situation? God, what's your will for my life? And I just want a step-by-step, linear plan to see into the future, and that's uh, just, like, just perfect, laid out right in front of me. But we're called to walk by faith, 
not by clarity. He never promises clarity. He promises that he will come through. We must trust that God is working when we don't know how it will work out. Maybe today we need to say, God, I give it up to you. Because if it's up to me, I will not come through. If it's up to you, I know that you will. You see, because the past is a promise. He's came through you time, for you time and time again. Trust him in whatever you're dealing with right now. He's not only providing bread to feed the people, he's providing an answer of who to turn to when you don't know what to do. You know, what's interesting to me is this miracle wasn't even really necessary. Like, nowhere in the four Gospels does it say these people were starving, these people were dying, these people were really hungry. No, they're just running up to Jesus to see Jesus, and he says, let's feed them. You see, the disciples' idea to send these people away would have worked. Like, that wasn't a dumb idea. Like, it was practical, and it would have worked. But what Jesus is doing is he's showing how big he is. It's not about the food here. It's about how he's the solution. It's about how he runs the show. And it says it so well in verse 14 and 15. It says, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. What Jesus is doing here is he's setting the stage. This act of sitting down so he can begin to move is telling these thousands of people where their eyes must be. He must be the one that's believed in in this moment. It can't be themselves. It can't be the disciples. Not anyone but Jesus. And they're wondering, okay, how's he going to do this? In verse 17 it says, And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. You see, this act of sitting down was an act of submission. And because they submitted to him, he provided satisfaction. There is true satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Submission always reaps satisfaction. So maybe it's time today to submit this idea that we can do it all on our own. Maybe it's time today to give up that sin that is just holding us back. Maybe it's time to give up this idea that, okay, that sin that I struggle with is just going to be something I always struggle with, so I'm just not even going to worry about. Maybe it's this idea of, um, okay, I'm going to submit myself to my job and my passions and my dreams. No, there's only freedom in Jesus Christ. There is only satisfaction in the bread of life. Let's see what the bread of life is in John 6, 47. This is Jesus talking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, today, the same Jesus who fed the 5,000 people that we're reading about is the same Jesus who's the bread of life. He's not given bread out of cargo shorts. He's the bread of life, and if you would just submit to him today, if you would just decide to give it all up, every burden, every struggle with sin, every fear that you don't know how it's going to work out, just lay it at his feet. Because in him, we can be eternally satisfied. Because he is the bread of life. I recently read a book called Gentle and Lowly, and it was so good. I'd recommend it to anybody. But the author says something like this. He says, we tend to think of miracles in the Gospels, that's interruptions of natural order. We tend to think of these as just outside of created order. But what we've forgotten is that we're so used to a fallen world with sickness, disease, pain, and death, so much so that that's what seems natural. The death and the problems of life and the addictions of life, that's what seems natural to us. But no, those are the interruptions. Those are the things that came when sin came into the world. And you say, these miracles, I've thought this too, you say these miracles only happened whenever Jesus was on the earth, whenever he was walking on, on this earth with these people in a physical embrace. Those are the only th times he did that. 
But what about Hebrews 13 that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? The same Jesus who wept at the tomb of Lazarus weeps with you in your lonely despair. The same Jesus who put his arms around the lepers that no one else would touch or come near is the same Jesus who wants to put his arms around you when you feel misunderstood and you feel hopeless. The same Jesus who fed the 5,000 people when he didn't even need to is the same Jesus who wants to touch your life and pour blessings out on your life. You see, Jesus cannot help but to show mercy and compassion. It's who he is. We're told in 1 Corinthians 6 that you are not your own because you were bought with a price. And when you were bought with that price, the Holy Spirit dwells within you when you submit to your life to him. And you see, what that Holy Spirit does is it means Christ cares and provides for you nearer and tighter than any physical embrace ever did when he was on earth, with, with a physical embrace of sinners and sufferers. He's closer to you today, and he wants to care for you because, you see, his actions on earth reflected his heart towards you today because he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Because we're now his body. We're united to him. He cannot help but be compassionate if you would just give him the reins of your life. You may be here and you've been looking for any and everything else to keep you satisfied and it's not working. You're reaching, you're searching for something that's constant. Maybe a friend that won't leave you. You feel betrayed. You feel done wrong. You're looking for a consistent and caring friend. Maybe just one because it seems like everybody just ends up walking out on you. I can promise you that the bread of life is where you'll find that. John 6, 66 says, After this, after all these miracles that we've been talking about, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus says to the twelve disciples, Do you want to go his way as well? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I want to ask you today not to try to judge you, not to try to jump down your throat, but I want to ask you, if you're hanging on to something other than Jesus, where do you think that's going to get you? What's your purpose in life without Jesus? To whom else will you go? Because he has the words of eternal life. You're chasing something that's temporary, chasing something that can't hold any water. But we see here that Jesus has the words of eternal life. And I encourage you to not leave this place until you find out how to submit your life to him. Don't leave this place without talking to someone because I can promise you from experience, God's best is always better than the world's best. God's best is always better than the world's best. I'm not up here. Dallas doesn't preach every week trying to get you to follow Jesus so you can get a pat on the back, so you can jump through a hoop and say, look what I did. Not so you can invite people when you get baptized and they can come see you. While all of those things are good and all those things are encouraging, that's not what it's about. It's about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following the one who loves us, the one who cares for us, the one who provides for us in our time of need. See, Jesus is the only one who can provide for you like no one else can because he's the true bread. All because he cares. He provided a way for us to live in freedom. Whenever he died on the cross, he lived a sinless, perfect life and took on our shame, my shame, my sin, and said, I love you this much. And then he rose again, and we can do the same thing. Submit your life to him today because Jesus is worth it. Lord, I thank you for all you've done, all that you are, all that you're doing in this service, all that you're doing in this church. And God, I pray that today someone will just give their life to you, maybe several people, God. Lord, it's nothing that I've said, nothing that I can think up or uh, anything that I can do or communicate. God, it's all you. Lord, it's your message. And Lord, I pray that you've spoken to hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll soften hearts. And Lord, I pray that you can just transform them, make them new. Make all things new today. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I love you and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.